And without further ado, I'd like to turn the session over to Atlantic Cape Community College. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here today for Global Here, um, We're going to get started. Um, my name is Michael Barnes. I am the, uh, the director of the Center for Accessibility here at Atlantic Cape Community College. Uh, we're here to talk about sort of our journey to accessibility um, over the last few years. <laughs> um, so this all started, as you may know, uh, with the consent decree. Um, so if you're not familiar with the, with the consent decree, um, it's a legally binding document that uh, we entered into with the National Federation for the Blind um, to, you know, to help us to make our content and our campus a little bit more accessible. So on July the 7th, 2015, we entered into a consent decree. As part of this consent decree, um, among many other things, we, uh, we had agreed to make 100% of all of our instructional materials fully accessible within three years, um, which has been, uh, when, we first, when, when we first saw that, we were thinking, oh my gosh, this is a, um, this is a task. This is gonna be, um, this is going to be interesting because 100% full accessibility is um is difficult under the best of circumstances. Um, so, well, the the uh, the very first thing that we did when we came in is it you know um, I should start with it. Chad and Chad Bullock, who you'll uh, you'll hear from in a second, and myself, um, our positions were actually part of the consent decree. So. Uh, we were hired by the college um, sort of in response to this to uh, to kind of rebuild the program to kind of look at um, the what was then called disability support services looking at that seeing kind of how we can make this a fully accessible program and one of the things that we started with this is looking at sort of why are we doing this right and the idea is that that we that we from from the very beginning we came up with is we're not going to do this we're not going to make things accessible for the sake of compliance but we're going to have we're going to have accessibility for the sake of student access um the compliance will come right by you know if we become more student focused and we dive more into um the student experience and ensuring that our students can access materials the compliance piece will come and that's um that's definitely what we found um, and then we started to look at the consent decree as a good thing, um, right? We had this document in front of us that now is a roadmap for us to uh, completely follow and uh, and to make sure that uh, that we are the institution that we need to be for our students. Um, so it, pro it pro provided capacity. We talk about the two new positions with Chad and myself, um, the allocation of resources and the prioritization of accessibility. Right, so what this allowed us to do was to take the minimal resources that we had available to us. As we all know, you know, there's not a lot of money floating around higher education for much of anything, let alone accessibility. Um, so, you know, we, we were able to take the limited resources that we had and build a program um, that supported our students. All right, so it was a blueprint to take action. Um, the perfect roadmap. Um, so we went through and we were able to um, identify things like tr trainings. Uh, well, they'll talk, they'll talk a lot more about training here in a second, but we were able to work with our human resources department and to mandate trainings, right? And just work on creating a culture of accessibility. So um, to create a, col a positive culture of accessibility at the institution, issue here. So it was incredibly important for us to create a culture of accessibility at, at Atlantic Cape Community College. And we we're very, very, very lucky that our higher administration from the board to our president, the vice presidents, um, were, full, were fully into this from the very, very, very beginning um, and incredibly supportive. And again, not just for the sake of compliance, but to change the culture of the institution, which I think is so, so, so important. Um, and we looked at the uh, the consent decree, and we looked at the uh, the NFB as a resource. 
So we said, okay, you know, these are all these things that we have to do. The NFB um, is well versed in it. So instead of looking at the consent decree as this giant entity of, you know, where we're in trouble, we're, we're in a part of this lawsuit, we looked at it as a resource. So first thing we did is we reached out to the NFB and we said, what can we do? You know, how can we work together to make this a more inclusive place? We, uh, we decided to hire students with disabilities to help us test software. So I think Chad will talk about this a little bit later, but we had actually hired a blind student as a consultant to test our software for us, right? And to test the campus environment. So now we know for a fact, you know, we're, we're not just reading a VPAT, right? Although, you know, we all love VPATs, but, um, you know, being able to take that VPAT and then put it into practice um, with a student who's going to be using the software and then provide a wonderful data point from there saying, you know, for instance, if a student, you know, if the VPAT says that everything's good and then the student, we have, have the student testing it and the student gets stuck, we can then go back to the vendor and say, even though this is in the VPAT, here's where our student is getting stuck. What can we do to best support that? Um, and it was a forced audit of our processes. So we actually were able to take all of the, um, all the policy, all the, all of the procedure, and we rebuilt it all. And we went around to a bunch of different colleges and universities to figure out who's doing it really, really well. Um, and to take so some of those ideas and bring them back to Atlantic Cape. So it wasn't something that we built from scratch. We took ideas from all over the place and kind of, uh, rebuild our program in that fashion. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to talk about how we created the Center for Accessibility real quick. Um, so we came into this as a student-centered, student-focused above all else. We are not doing this purely for compliance. Do we have to be in compliance? Absolutely, 100%. But the way that we view that is is uh, we're viewing it as a student-centered, how can we make sure that we are the most accessible place for our students? Um, and then we offer faculty support, right? We need to be, we, we need to break down silos and we need to be, um, you know, completely transparent with our faculty and to be able to work with our faculty. So, you know, we offered faculty support from the very beginning, not only through the creation and the remediation of their content, but in training, like Chad will talk about. We were able to work with them to be able to create their own materials. So we weren't, at no point in time were we creating materials or remediating materials specifically for faculty. We're making sure we were doing it with faculty to ensure that they had ownership of the process and that they understood truly how, you know, it can be a very daunting thing when you look at it at first, but to realize in practicality how undaunting it is. And uh, both Chad and Michelle did a wonderful job of really breaking down that stigma of how difficult accessibility can be. Um, so like I said, we rebuilt policy and procedure. We went from the ground up. Um, and then we rebranded the office. So we decided that, you know, you know, while we serve as students with disabilities, we talk a lot about, you know, you know, we're not, we're all about access, right? So we changed the name from Disability Support Services to the Center of Disability to, to uh, truly support that mission. Um, collaboration across campus. This wouldn't have worked had we not been in collaboration with every single part of our campus, from the faculty to upper administration, facilities. Um, every single part of the college is part of this process and had bought in, again, for accessibility's sake, not for compliance. Um, and, the, and the institution made it an absolute priority. So we were able to, you know, really build a program with full support um, of the faculty and of the administration and of the, of the college, which has, been, uh, which has been wonderful. I'm going to turn this over to Chad Bullock to talk about the implementation of accessibility on campus. Thank you, Mike. Um, as Mike said, uh, Chad Bullock, Senior Manager, also uh, Adaptive Technologist uh, for Center for Accessibility. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how we uh, went about educating uh, faculty and staff on these topics of accessibility, which we felt was probably the most important thing. You know, education is power, right? Knowledge is power. So 
we wanted to break down any type of um, apprehensions or stresses uh, that faculty and staff had uh, with this initiative. So in doing so, we put together a curriculum, um, a curriculum of workshops, which we offered face-to-face uh, -face workshops. We offered online uh, style workshops. And the bullet points that are listed here are the topics that we decided to, to go with. Um, I just want to make sure that you understand that the, the knowledge that we gained here are from industry leaders, you know, so we couldn't do this stuff without without places like, uh, you know, your obvious places, the W3C, the IAAP, ATIA, um, DQ University. There's so many resources out there that we're so grateful of that um, share their information so that we can bring that information back. And, and basically what I did was I, I, I took the major points of that information and I packaged it into these workshops and customized them in a way that I thought would work or be most beneficial in our environment at, at the community college. So we ran workshops constantly. I mean, constantly. We probably have run upwards of 100 workshops within the past, you know, close to two years or so, and we don't cancel them. We'll, we'll uh, train as many people as possible. Even if there's only one person that needs training, I will make it uh, you know, a priority to meet with that person to make sure that they get trained um, as, long as, they, as long as they're interested. So intro, introduction to accessibility, that was, that's a workshop that we offered. However, I got to say that that workshop came in a little bit late because what we were finding with that workshop was faculty already had some, some knowledge about accessibility. And, and I'll tell you why on the next slide in a few minutes, but they already had, uh, you know, that knowledge of accessibility. They had, they, you know, they got the memo about the consent decree and the things that needed to happen. They were really uh, coming to that workshop saying, you know, we need something tangible. Tell me, how do I actually implement this and what can I actually do to get going? So the second bullet point that you see there, creating accessible content, we actually named that um, Access 101, right, in traditional uh, college sense. But the uh, Creating Accessible uh, Digital Content workshop is the one that has been attended the most. Um, people really enjoy that workshop, I think. Um, and I could see that because they actually attended two or three times, you know, not just once. They come back uh, to get some more stuff. But that, that workshop, we focused really on the tangible items, you know, things that the techniques that you can learn and implement immediately when you leave that work, workshop in, in your own content. And that one was probably the most valuable. So if there's anything you get out of this webinar, it's probably, you know, making sure you have enough activities, hand activities, things that really represent, um, you know, making a difference, those techniques that your faculty and staff can bring back immediately and start getting, start getting involved with. Um, the other one here we have is uh, selecting and adopting accessible materials. And this would go along that bucket of procurement, you know, and, and purchasing items and choosing textbooks and, and course materials and, and things like that. Um, what I want to say about this workshop is that, you know, we provided faculty with not only cheat sheets, I guess, or, or not only the knowledge about why we're doing this and how it affects uh, students, but also cheat sheets. But we also provided them with almost a script you know, of, of what to say when, when they're going out and talking to publishers before they just adopt the textbook. You know, we just wanted them to take a, a little bit of a time out to say, we understand that you want to adopt this textbook, but let's also ingest accessibility into, into the process. And um, what we didn't foresee is how well faculty did with this. Uh, faculty really went back, at, you know, at the, uh, at the publishers uh, to say, you know, I want this material, but it needs to be accessible. Can you please help us out? And um, one thing that came out of this is we now have a very, uh, like Mike said, transparent uh, partnership with the publishers where we've been helping them and they've been helping us, uh, you know, your big publishers, the ones that we all know in higher ed, you know, you have your Pearsons and your Sengage, Wiley and McGraw-Hill, you know, we're working with them. With we, we really didn't expect that to happen. We thought that we would get a lot of pushback, um, especially in the early goings. You know, we just thought it was just going to be such a such a big uh, topic to overcome. But it, it became a, a situation where the publishers were saying, "Yeah, we know about Atlantic Cape, and we know, you know, we've heard from the faculty and the department heads. We know exactly what you're looking for." And they would actually come prepared with with V pats and uh, you know <laughs> answers to certain questions about accessibility. So. So proud uh, that the faculty and staff really took that upon themselves to, to drive that initiative home. 
Um, currently, we're also offering workshops on universal design and instruction for, for learning. Um, this is something that we did offer, um, you know, just on, on a personal basis. I'd like to revamp that a little bit. I think our faculty and staff are kind of well versed on accessibility. They're well versed on laws and guidelines. And now they're looking for new ways to, to implement accessibility as opposed to just you know, the standard making content accessible. They're looking for design, you know, they're looking for theoretical frameworks. There's a lot of discussion on campus about rubrics uh, uh, and things like that. So that's kind of the progress that we're making and, and um, the direction that we're going. Um, I want to say that, you know, before I said that faculty were well versed, well, they were well versed because the school dedicated, you know, professional development to accessibility prior to the her accessibilities uh, workshop curriculum. So what we did was we ded dedicated two full day sessions strictly to accessibility and, and we covered everything in those um, sessions, meaning, you know, accessibility, the law, the situation we're in, uh, the responsibilities that we have, and then we coupled that with hands on activities, uh, demonstrations, uh, collaborative exercises. And we think that that was extremely beneficial that everybody was on board and everybody walked away from those sessions with a real good understanding of the situation uh, that we're in and and the uh, you know the direction that the school is heading um, it also took away i think a little bit of stress or maybe anxiety about it about the um, initiative so i think that was really really important um, another thing that we did was we got with a, a project that we have, which is called Adjunct Orientation Day. So anytime we have newly hired adjunct instructors, um, again, we're a small community college. Sometimes it's difficult to get everybody involved in every process in terms of communication channels. So we wanted to make sure that the, our adjunct faculty, who we value so, so much, is involved in the processes that we have. So. Uh, the Center for Accessibility and Instructional Technology, we were able to carve out uh, some time at Adjunct Orientation Day where we can provide um, our, our newly hired adjuncts or all of our, our adjuncts actually um, with um, you know, information regarding you know, accessibility, the expectations we have, our workshops so that they can join in and get trained as quickly as possible and also any other resources that we had. Um, another thing that happened, that faculty took it upon themselves to have these informal, what they were calling like sandbox sessions. So basically bring your lunch and work with your peers on some of your content. And um, there's so much feedback from that that it was really valuable to kind of that, you know, just work with your peers on something real specific um, in their content. So all of these different outlets helped us get educated very quickly on accessibility. And more importantly, it helped us do things the right way as opposed to like Mike mentioned before, silos where people were trying to do things on their own. You know, it was a real collaborative um, effort. Um, we did um, a repository of information. Uh, we did create a web page uh, called uh, Creating Accessible Digital Content. And this is extremely important for me in my position because I would have um, a lot of faculty and staff maybe send me an email or stop into my office saying, you know, I just have this specific question about this specific way or this specific technique to do something. And having this stuff already there, I could simply send them a link, I can direct them to a page, and then they could also read up on other things that maybe they weren't really sure about. You know, it, it's, just a, it's just a really nice uh, resource for them. Um, currently, we're, we're redesigning this. Um, we're actually getting a whole new redesigned website in general, the whole, you know, for the whole school. And this is something that we're focusing on. We're going to really uh, make this a bit more robust. And, um, you know, it's just such a valuable, valuable resource for faculty and staff. And you see the bullet points here. These are some of the buckets that we cover uh, on that web page. I also want to talk about the Center for Accessibility a little bit, being, being a manager in Center for Accessibility and the adaptive technologist. You know, this is a position that wasn't really offered at the school uh, prior. And I think it's just so important to have a, a technologist that can work with the students, you know, one on one. Uh, but also what we did is we looked at some of the processes that we had in the department. And we thought, you know what, how can we make them even better or even stronger, you know, or how maybe we need to add some things. So uh, these are some of the things that we really took a look at. Uh, we revamped these processes a little bit, um, you know, a, a scribe request or a note taker, note taker request from, from students for Center for Accessibility. These processes now are all digital. Uh, we focus on, uh, you know, on 
anonymity. Uh, we promote independence with these processes. And what I mean by all digital is we take advantage here at, here at Atlantic Cape, all of our email addresses are Gmail, uh, Gmail addresses. So we take advantage of all the products that Google has to offer that, that we can use. Um, the note taker process, for instance, you know, this is all digital now, so it's way more accessible. We, we take advantage of Google Drive. And in my um, position as adaptive technologist, I can sit with, with a student um, who's involved in the, in the note taker request process. I can make sure that, you know, I can demo how to access notes. I can make sure that they're doing it correctly. I can make sure that they're downloading their notes or, or accessing their notes in a lot of different channels in the way that they need to access them. And it really promotes independence. And, and so far, you know, we've gotten a lot of feedback that, it, that it's working. You know, it's really doing. The other thing that, that's going on is the quality of the notes is getting so much better, you know, because now they're all typed out. Students can access them anytime from any location. And they can take those notes, like I said, and, and get them in different formats if needed. You know, they can bring them down into different formats, as opposed to a, an older style, traditional sense of, you know, handwritten notes that are that are tucked away somewhere. And, and a student may have had to, you know, go to an office to go pick them up or something. So it's all digital. Um, we have uh, forms online to, to, to request these services. Um, we get back to the individuals uh, very quickly you know, about these services, and we're really proud of the progress that we've made um, as we revamp this. Um, alternative format acquisition as well, so important with accessibility. Um, in our position, we've leveraged the vendors that we work with, you know, so um, we always had, you know, vendor relationships on campus, but what we did is we took that and we really strengthened them. You know, it's commonplace now to use uh, services such as Bookshare, and, and learning ally and access text. And, uh, you know, that's something that falls on my shoulders a bit to make sure that that process is being used uh, to its full extent. And uh, the feedback has been phenomenal from, uh, you know, students as well, that now something that may have create, you know, may have taken, who knows, 15 to, you know, well, now it's 15 or 20 minutes, you know, something that may have taken a few days. Uh, to achieve to get alternative formats or a week or something like that. Now it's, you know, one meeting with the adaptive technology, see what you need, let's see the resources we have, and, and we could get you those uh, very quickly. So um, I also wanted to talk about, before I, I turn things over to, to my coworker and a few slides here, um, we added some services uh, that we really didn't have before. So like I said, the school went out and we, they created this position of an adaptive technology specialist. Um, What's important about this position is that you know you get evaluation and recommendations, right? So it's so valuable to be able to work with students one on one uh, from the Center for Accessibility because although we have a lot of tools in our toolbox, you know, and a lot of things we can implement, one size doesn't always fit all, right? One size just does not fit all. So being able to sit and sit with a uh, a student and, and train them on a piece of technology see how they're um, you know using that technology how often they're using that technology how you know the feedback whether it's actually working for them or not and then being able to adjust the game plan has been really really valuable here at the school um, i don't know if that was uh, as strong as it was in the past as it is now so um you know it's it's creating relationships and it's learning from the students as much as as they learn from us so it's a really nice cycle we also added an equipment loaner program that we're really proud of and it's something that we're always looking to expand on our equipment loaner program has a number of pieces of assistive and adaptive equipment that a student can loan out for an entire semester right so as opposed to having a piece of equipment in a classroom that a student would go in and use right just in a classroom period and then leave the classroom and, and not be able to use it again we switched that up a little bit we brought in some some new devices uh, some new some new technology, some new uh, software programs that a student can use throughout the entire semester, right? So this is now they can go to library study, they can take it home with them, they can really get used to the to the equipment and use it to its full extent. So this is a program that we're really proud of. We're constantly updating and revamping that program based on feedback from our students, and we're always looking to to extend that program. 
Um, also, you know, with the Center for Accessibility, in, in my position, uh, probably a little more specifically, being that I'm a technologist, we also offer the remediation services. So that means uh, faculty and staff at any time now has someone that they can go to when they have, you know, questions about, you know, making content or anything, um, even if they're purchasing something, you know, making that accessible, right? Making sure they're meeting um, accessibility standards. And it's important because, you know, they can learn, you know, some of the low tech things, right? But sometimes some things are a little bit more tech heavy and it's nice to have someone uh, in a position that could really, you know, step in and support that. And, and also, uh, even more importantly, maybe offer maybe some different solutions, right? How many times do you hear at your school that, you know, it's always been done that way, right? Or this is how it's always been. So instead, we can look at design aspects now. And that's something that, you know, this position that I'm in, I can bring that to the table. You know, I've gotten a lot of a lot of things, uh, a lot of documents or a lot of forms or something that we've always had in the past where I can take a look at and say, you know, instead of sitting here and trying to remediate this form, right, to make it accessible, why don't we look at the design of the form? You know, this is a form that's been around a while and it hasn't been changed in a while. Why don't we why don't we maybe adjust the design from the very beginning and take a look at what we're really trying to accomplish? And in doing so, uh, we've really updated a lot of the information that we have here. Uh, to make it not only accessible, but just easier, you know, easier to navigate, easier to fill out and easier to contact someone with, in, in a lot of different, uh, you know, aspects here at the school. So, you know, the remediation services, uh, it's just so important to be able to have that support circle, you know, for faculty and staff. And we think that we're, we're doing a really good job with it and we're always looking to improve that. Um, in speaking with remediation services on the academic side, they took it upon themselves to, um, you know, to create a new position for uh, academic support. So um, this individual, I'm just going to call her out. She might even be listening today, Trixie Norris, right? She's been doing a fantastic job um, helping faculty and supporting them and remediating their content. And it's really important because, you know, a lot of faculty members have the best intentions to get their content remediated. But sometimes there's a time crunch, right? Or, or sometimes there's new, there's some curveballs, and they just need some support in order to get these, these, this initiative done and get and get things uh, made the way that they want them made. So we have that support system now. They can go uh, to the remediation specialist who's going to help with uh, document remediation. And that's what's important as well is that we really kept it to um, content or documentation, right? So that way. Um, that individual can really go through that, can be an expert on just that specific portion, you know, of what we're trying to make accessible. And then we have experts for other things. You know, when you get into multimedia and things like that, they would probably come back over here to the Center for Accessibility for recommendations and remediation. Um, and, and that was a conscious decision that we made to keep, to keep the ball rolling and to get things done as quickly and, and efficiently as possible. And I know from feedback from the faculty, you know, they love Trixie and the work she's been doing. They love the fact that they have that that support uh, staff position and, um, you know, it's working. You know, the results are there. So we still work, you know, we work very closely as well uh, with the academic side constantly, you know, in terms of professional development. Um, I keep my uh, finger or pulse on, on the industry for accessibility. So anytime I see something out there that, that we can bring in that's going to help, um, it's easy now to spread the word of that. You know, I could get that information out very quickly because a lot of silos have been broken down and a lot of support has been encouraged. You know, those outlets are there. So um, I'm going to turn things over to um, Michelle Perkins, who's going to go over a few things about some of the other tools right that we've brought in to help with this accessibility initiative um so michelle i'll turn things over to you sure thanks chad um mike started with uh talking to us a little bit today about the consent decree that the college was in with the nfb and you know one of the most important things that that we kept hanging dangling in front of us was all of our content must be accessible by July 7th, 2018. And I have to tell you, that was, uh, that was a little overwhelming when we, when we first got started. And there were times when we wondered if we were going to get there or not. Not only did it need to be accessible, but it needed to be um, 
have a goal of being 100% WCAG 2.0 AA accessible. So we had quite a We had uh, quite a project uh, that we had to get through. <laughs> um, as a part of this, we were required to develop a plan. Um, you know, the, the important thing, I, I get asked this a lot, well, how do you even start? Where do you get started? Um, a plan obviously helped us very much to get to where we are today, but the most important thing is just that you get started. There, there's so many times that I talk to people and they're so overwhelmed about where to start that they're just like, I don't even know where to start. I don't even know the resources. So what's the point? Um, there is a point and you need to do it and you just have to get started. As part of our plan, we had a consent decree task force that was formed at the college that uh, includes key stakeholders from all throughout the entire college that sit on this. We meet bi-weekly. And it's really um, done quite a bit to break down those silos and to get us working together to truly understand how we can help each other achieve this goal that's been set out in front of us. And what we needed to develop was a corrective action strategy. And this corrective action strategy broke down each requirement that was set out to us in the consent decree and we needed to provide our strategy for meeting that requirement. And obviously we weren't going to meet all of those requirements, you know, immediately as soon as this was started, but we need to provide updates and to monitor that. So we can constantly be gauging our progress, making sure that we're moving forward. So in my role as the Blackboard Administrator, uh, one of the first things we started looking at is what can we do uh, to make Blackboard a little more accessible. And one of the first things that we did back in fall 2016 is we instituted a standardized course menu. So that way we had consistent navigation. Um, prior to that, faculty, um, you know, you could, a student could be taking five different courses and the navigation on that menu would look drastically different. And, you know, students really, it made it tough for students. And after we instituted this course menu, we surveyed our students and how they felt about it. And we had a lot of positive feedback. You know, again, this is part of that universal design and that um, you're trying to do something to better it. And it's actually making it a better experience for all of your students. And our students were excited about the fact that they found their tests all in the same place in all the courses and the syllabus all in the same place in all the courses and their communication tools all in the same place. You know, it's, it's out of that consistency is really important here. Um, another big effort that we did was we decided to begin creating department standard course shells. Um, these aren't quite uh, global yet. We don't have them everywhere yet. They're still being worked on, but we have quite a few of them. They're managed by our full-time department faculty who, you know, they work with the publishers to get the accessible content and preload them, making sure that the syllabus and course timelines and PowerPoints and other things that are preloaded into these courses are all accessible to start with. And then those course shells then become available for other full-time faculty or even more importantly, our adjunct faculty who, you know, often are hired in the 11th hour and don't have time to do this whole pro process themselves, um, they're able to hit the ground running and have the content they need to be more successful and have the content that their students need to be more successful. Um, we also started in fall 2018 requiring the use of Blackboard with all courses. Prior to that, all of our online courses used Blackboard. Uh, many of our traditional courses use Blackboard, but not all of them. So again, we had consistency where all students knew that they were going to have a Blackboard course shell and there would be certain content that they could definitely find in those course shells. Other initial efforts that we started with uh, was the adoption of ReadSpeaker in fall 2016. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with ReadSpeaker, it's a text-to-speech solution that students um, can click a listen button and it'll allow, it will then read aloud the Blackboard course content 
and our students, we had really high numbers of students using it. Um, last academic year, we had close to 10,000 times that users clicked and used that listen button. Uh, we have seen this number decrease a little bit since our adoption of Blackboard Ally, but it's still being heavily used by our students, so we're going to continue to use this technology. So, you know, as Chad talked about, faculty, you know, we had all those resources in place with Trixie creating, you know, helping the faculty get their content accessible and all of our training sessions and faculty development days. So faculty were working on changing their content, making it more accessible. We were making these changes to Blackboard, trying to make Blackboard more accessible, but we really had no way to monitor the accessibility of our content in Blackboard and to measure our success. Now, you know, obviously, um, we have to use many tools as we're going along to make sure that our content's accessible. We can use other uh, automatic checkers, manual dean, but when Blackboard Alley came on the scene in April 2017, we were pretty excited. I mean, honestly, we, uh, you know, our initial thoughts when we sat through our first presentation were like, really, is this too good to be true? There's no way this could actually be this helpful to us. And, you know, but if, it, you know, we decided to give it a shot and we adopted it immediately. And we started with a pilot in fall 2017 that included faculty from across all of our academic departments. And our pilot was so successful and our faculty loved it so much that we actually turned it on mid semester, which is something as a Blackboard administrator, I don't ever like to do, um, you know, do a global change like that mid semester, but we did. And faculty began using it immediately. We held workshops to train our faculty and we were immediately able to begin measuring our success and what we were doing. Now, if we go back to spring 2017 and look at our, we had initial training efforts, very initial training efforts, no Blackboard Ally. And, you know, once we turned Ally on, we were able to actually go back and look at our courses and the accessibility of them. We actually had zero course shells that had a 100% score. And um, only four courses that were scored 90% or higher, and only 55 course shells that were even scored green. Um, we obviously had quite a few more courses than that in our spring 2017 semester, so that really gives you a good idea of um, you know, how inaccessible our content was that was up on Blackboard at that time. So then if you move forward a little bit to fall 2017, where we still had those initial training efforts and we had our Blackboard Ally pilot, we started to see change. Um, you know, it wasn't massive change at this point, but we, it was change and it was positive change and it was change in the right direction. Um, you know, we, we had three course shells that were 100%. We were pretty pretty excited about that. We had 14 course shells with a 90% or higher score, and we had moved up to 86 courses that were actually scored green. So if we move forward one year later uh, to spring 2018, Blackboard Ally was live in all of our courses. Our training efforts were, you know, full blown at this point. Uh, you know, offering many workshops workshops and webinar sessions um, on a monthly basis, our scores really, really started to see significant improvement. We were up to seven courses that had a 100% score, 60 course shells with a 90% score or higher. We're up to 188 of our course shells that were actually considered to be basically accessible. There was room for some improvement, but they really had turned things around and were moving in the right direction. If we move forward to this past year, um, in summer 2018, the master technician of instructional technology, Josh Carroll, he created a report that actually pulled that Blackboard Ally institutional data out. Uh, for any of you who do use Blackboard Ally and look at that report that you can export, it, you know, it's, there's a lot of numbers and it's not real pretty for people who don't know what they're looking at to look at but he had it automatically convert into a very um, usable format for our academic deans to be able to quickly look at um, the reports sent to them on a weekly basis where they could really actively be involved 
in the monitoring of the accessibility in our course shells. And each week as our deans receive these reports, they go down the list, it's easily identified who might be struggling and, and they then reach out to the faculty, not in a, oh, well, you know, you have big problems, what are you doing wrong, but more, I see you may be struggling a little bit. We have these resources that can help you. How can I help you in, you know, improving your score in working through whatever the issue is that's in your course right now? And I'm happy to say that this spring, the average score for all of our spring 2019 courses is 90%. Um, which is just remarkable. And it's really evident of just how much work we've done and just how far we've come from when we started this progress, uh, this process. This spring, we were given some additional statistics that we actually didn't even know we were able to get. You know, one of the main reasons that we adopted Blackboard Ally was we needed a way to demonstrate that we were moving in a positive direction. But there were these also these other really important aspects of Ally that we knew were there. We trained faculty and talked to them about it and we talked to students about it, but we had no idea um, how much they were being used. And the first was the alternative format downloads. Now, for anyone not you know, familiar with Ally, again, for every piece of accessible content that a faculty member uploads into Blackboard, Ally will automatically convert that into other alternative formats. And you can see those types there. But in a little over a year, our students, our users, have downloaded almost, you know, almost uh, 5,800 alternative formats they're using it, um, you know, and, and having more conversations with our students, they're like, oh yeah, we found that and that's awesome. It's been so helpful and we didn't even know they were using it. And if we knew they were using it, we didn't know that they were using it to this extent. And Michelle, if I could just jump Absolutely. in for one second and talk to that point, you know, this isn't just Center for Accessibility Students. You know, that's, that's what these numbers are representing. This is benefiting everybody, every student at the college. You know, everyone's using these type of tools uh, to, to better succeed in, in their courses. Absolutely. And, you know, along with that, we also sh were shown that our faculty were using that instructor feedback. Uh, there's instructor feedback built into Ally that when they upload a piece of content, they get the little indicator and they can click on that and Ally will either say, hey, you're doing a fantastic job, it's perfect, or, you know, these are some things you can do to improve the accessibility. Look how many times they're using it. They're using it, um, you know, we're, we're moving up on 13,000 times they've used it in the past year, which is just remarkable. Now, the number of files that were actually altered um, although it's it's a great number, it's really not indicative of how helpful this feedback has been because many times what happens is the faculty member takes the feedback, goes back to their original document, and then re-uploads the document instead of remediating it within Blackboard. So, you know, we've had quite a few noticeable outcomes from all these changes that Mike and Chad and I have talked about today. Um, you know, our faculty and staff, they have a much better understanding of things like the, the hardware and software that's commonly used by students with disabilities. You know, when we talk to them about screen readers or about, oh yeah, I know what that is, or, you know, it's not like we're talking another language to them now. Like they actually understand what it is we're talking about. And they're more comfortable with the accommodation process and with the instructions that are associated with that when they get those accommodation letters at the beginning of each semester and how they can better help their students and work with them. They're more comfortable actually working and interacting with students with disabilities, which has been a really positive um, you know, effect of all of this. And then lastly, they just have a much better understanding of how to make accessible content, of how to make sure that they're using an accessible product and how to make sure that when they're designing, um, they're designing with inclusive design in mind. Yeah, and you know, I just want to jump in as well with, with the first bullet point there or, or you know, talking about faculty and staff having a bit of a better understanding. I remember when we first started this process, I would get a lot of questions from faculty along the lines of, okay, what's going on with this accessibility <laughs> initiative? Um, and, and what do I need to do? And, and now I have faculty members come up to me saying things like, you know, I tried to implement this, uh, you know, over here on a document and 
I remember in your training, you had mentioned to do this, but I did it a different way. And, it, you know, I like how, how that conversation has turned a bit more. Uh, so I know that, um, you know, that's not a, that's not something that you can measure with statistics. You know, it's just something that, that you measure uh, through, like we said, the culture change a little bit. And I, we do think that we're making an impact uh, with the education uh, with faculty and staff because of those conversations. So we do have a lot of progress. You know, we're, we're certainly, you know, still going to keep going. Um, we always feel like there's tons of room uh, for improvement. Um, like I said, the the, uh, the college is going to reboot their uh, their website, redesign. It's going to be so much more robust for students. It's going to be easier to navigate, and and they're really making a lot of wonderful changes uh, that department. Um, so. For us, once those changes are made, we're going to have a lot of um, ability, I guess, to, to add uh, more information, more resources, guides, tutorials, and things like that, and sort of redesign the way we're uh, disseminating that information. So we're in constant conversations now about the best ways uh, to design that and disseminate that information, and, and we're really looking forward, forward to those changes. Um, we're also going to reboot, reboot our accessibility trainings a bit. Um, I don't think with the way faculty and staff, how knowledgeable they are now on, you know, the basics of accessibility and some of the techniques. Now they're, they're hungry for something else, you know. They want to be able to, to go to sessions and ask uh, specific questions about content and get answers to those type of things. So a little bit more uh, customization. We'd also like to bring in a few more, you know, experts in the industry maybe and, and do some events with things like that. Um, we're kicking around some some um, ideas for advocacy events and things like that. Um, the assessment um, for for workshops and attendees, you know, they're doing such a great job of uh, making their content accessible. We want to provide them with some type of recognition for that. So we're looking at uh, different ways to assess the knowledge uh, of some of the attendees uh, that we have at these workshops. And like I said, some recognition of completion of that workshop because they're, they're really putting forth such, such a big effort. Um, we're also looking at some scenario based learning exercises. You know, I think this is really important. Um, this will center more on really the student aspect of it, you know, the, the end design. You know, sometimes we focus too much on how to build accessible content that we fail to recognize really the impact it's having on the student. So we're trying to really shine a light on that student experience and the success student have uh, with the accessible content that we're focusing on. Um, for the Center for Accessibility, you know, we, we have some plans for improvement as well. Um, you know, we, we definitely want to spread a little bit more advocacy and awareness uh, by sharing student success stories, which we've been doing a bit this year. Um, we're going to do that uh, using our new web page that's going to be coming out and some of our um, social media platforms such as Facebook and things like that. Um, it spreads a little bit more advocacy and really, again, uh, focusing on the student experience as opposed to just, you know, making things accessible, right? How it really affects uh, our student population. Um, we're also looking at the improvement of our notification delivery of what we're calling our days of recognition. You know, we've always had these here at the school, so we really want to shine a light on these a little bit more. Um, a day like today, right? Global Accessibility Awareness Day. This is so important to us. And um, we want, we want, really want to make sure that our college community is aware of the efforts that we're taking to, to shine a light on, on this initiative. So these, these are some of the bulleted, uh, bulleted points here of things that we like to wreck here on, at, on our, our campus. So um, I'm going to turn things back over uh, to our moderator, Sally. Um, and um, she could talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, BB World and wrap things up a little bit for us. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I'm really excited by everything you were able to share and everything you were able to do um, with Ally, but beyond that, too, just the, the whole act, um, work stream that you put into place. I did want to announce that BB World is this. Um, this summer, July 22nd to 25th, the first couple of days are our DevCon. So it's a, a more for the developer. It's a little bit more techy. And then the last um, three days, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday, Thursday, are um, BB World, which is a great uh, opportunity for everyone who is a Blackboard customer, but also people who are interested in learning more about Blackboard services. I did have turned, I have turned on questions in the chat. You are able to ask questions there. So if you'd like to take a minute to type your questions into the chat, I know I saw a few um, hands 
raised during the session. Now is your opportunity to questions. The first question is asked, uh, were faculty required to attend trainings on accessibility? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Um, not, not the full training suite, but for the initial creation and remediation of accessible content, um, they were required to attend that training. Um, and we um, worked that out through human resources, um, and it uh, worked really well. Um, it says, how many uh, total courses do we do we run on average, I guess, per semester? Michelle, do you have any type of numbers for that? Or um, That's a tough one. It's a, it's a fluctuation each semester. It is a so fluctuation, sure. especially with enrollment. And when we're measuring uh, courses, we're actually not even, we're measuring the, the course shells. So sometimes we have um, a variation of course shells the way that we have it set up at Atlantic Cape, but I'd say a safe number would be between 650 and 750 in regards to courses. And uh, we'll, we'll try to get to as, as many questions as possible, but I see, um, you know, how do we measure the, the success or the impact um, from the student's perspective? So, you know, feedback from students is just, you know, the most important thing. So what we try to do is we have uh, different surveys or forms out there that are easily accessible through our, through our websites that students can fill out. But we also have um, surveys and forms attached to every single workshop, every single service that we offer, especially uh, through the Center for Accessibility. So in other words, you know, if you're involved in the note taking process, then um, we have a form that we send out at the end of every semester to get feedback from students of not only like, you know, how easy was it to, to use the technology or the process that we have in place? And, and do you have any recommendations on how we could possibly improve the process? So it's really uh, based on uh, forms and surveys that we, we'd like that because we can get some analytics behind that. You know, we do leverage uh, Google Forms for the most part. And then we also, of course, speak with students one-on-one. -on -one. You know, every time we meet with a student, um, we had that uh, loaner program I was talking about where a student has to return the uh, equipment at the end of the semester. So we have a form and, and a, a basically a process then where we make sure we get a lot of feedback for all the things that they use in the Center for Accessibility. And then we try to, uh, you know, use that, uh, that feedback to better our processes. Uh, let me step in and answer a couple of the questions in regards to the metrics for faculty interacting with Ally. Uh, you're a, we are managed hosting and we were able to open up a ticket and request that. Uh, how were we able to entice faculty to move forward with our courses? Did we have to provide a stipend? No, there was no stipend, but one of the reasons we were very successful with that is because we had administration support. So we had people, vice president of academic affairs, kind of telling them you are going to do this. So and that helped quite a bit. And also, also, too, Michelle, I'll cut you off, but um, one of the things that we did as well is we have students on campus who um, are vi visually impaired and they do not have to register, as you know, with the disability office on campus. So we would work with the faculty members and say, like, there are, there could be individuals, and there are individuals on our campus with blind or visual impairments that may take your classes in the fall, and we may have no idea. Um, so being as prepared as possible and also putting a face to accessibility, I think, helped as well, saying you're going to have a student at some point taking your class and it's best to be prepared. And I think, you know, through the culture change at the institution, it just it just evolved that way. Uh, we are looking at beginning to integrate OER into our curriculum. We do have some faculty who are actively designing with that right now. Um, you know, it, it can be a little bit challenging to necessarily find accessible OER. So that's actually a journey that we're beginning right now. Um, so it says, can you provide additional insight regarding your procurement of adaptive uh, technology? So I think, um, yeah, we, you know, what we try to do is, you know, as adaptive technologists, I think that kind of falls into my lap for the most part, um, where I, I'm allowed to, you know, kind of make a lot of recommendations um, for the technology that we're bringing in. And I make those recommend, recommendations not only on what's going on in the industry, but also with our student population, what I know is working and what isn't working. So if we have some, you know, for instance, if we have some equipment that's kind of kind of gathering dust, you know, nobody's really interested in using it, then you know what? We're not going to invest any money in that type of stuff anymore, you know? 
Um, we are leveraging a lot of, um, you know, abilities with smartphones, um, iPads, tablets, and mobile devices, which are fantastic. Um, but I think, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to add something. Else. Um, but also what we've done is, you know, I get out there, I get out to conferences, expos, I talk to vendors, I work with vendors to let them know the situations that we're in and, and what we have available. Um, you know, so that, so I'm very transparent with those conversations. And I think Mike's going to probably talk about we're leveraging grants. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So we're doing a lot of work with uh, finding grants to support purchasing, you know, adaptive technologies. But also when we talk about, you know, the procuring things that are accessible. One of the things that we that, they, that the college has done is that um, they've added the Center for Accessibility as an as a approving entity for electronic, um, all electronic information and technology purchases. So the college cannot purchase anything without the approval of the Center for Accessibility, which is incredibly daunting and has been um, a little difficult, but I think it's, um, you know, it allows us a little more um, increased oversight in ensuring that what the college is purchasing is accessible from the jump. <clears throat> and I have a, a, you know, to follow it up, it says uh, what, equi uh, what equipment was loaned out. So uh, basically what it breaks down to is uh, some of your more traditional equipment. Uh, we have talking calculators. Um, but we also brought in and tape recorders, you know, which obviously aren't really tape recorders, right? They're digital recorders, but, you know, um, audio recorders, um, talking calculators. Um, we brought in some additional Braille equipment that was, uh, you know, really easy to acquire, to tell you the truth. Just jump out on Amazon. There's so many little pieces of equipment out there that make a big difference in a, in a student's life. I mean, you know, Braille rulers and things like that. Um, but more importantly, you know, we also brought in some uh, small mobile uh, digital magnifiers, you know, that we lend out, which is very helpful. Um, we also took advantage of older generation iPods, right? So they're fantastic. They still connect to the Internet. You can still download apps to them and they can still record and they can take pictures, right? So we're using those for things that they're probably not traditionally used for but they're older generation ones, so they're a little bit cheaper to, to acquire. Um, we're also, we do have some iPads. We're looking into now, you know, um, ingesting possibly some Chromebooks into the mix. Um, so that, that'll give you a snapshot of some of the things we have. And probably the more popular one, of course, would be the smart pens yeah. uh, for note taking. We have a good, good inventory that we've um, kind of acquired over the years of uh, smart pens that a lot of students really take advantage of. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea of, of some of the things that are available. I think we're only at two minutes and I see a lot of questions coming in, but we did, um, I believe the um, PowerPoint slides will be shared out. We have our email addresses on them. Uh, I want to get to all these questions, but there's no possible way. So it's really cool to, to have all these people submitting so many questions. Um, uh, but I don't know if we're going to be able to get too much more uh, within the time limit they've given us. So. Definitely feel free, feel free to reach out to us, especially through email and happy to work with you and, and get some ideas on your end of things as well. Because, you know, again, we're trying to navigate this as well as anyone else. And um, we hope that um, we're doing a good job and we really appreciate uh, feedback and collaboration from our peers. So thank you so much for um, paying attention, really, and, and inputting so many questions. This is terrific. And all these questions are being are part of the recorded um, caption of this session, so we will have them. Um, and if necessary, we can reach out to you with responses. Um, thank you again, all of you, very much. We are coming up to the end of our time, and I did want to thank our speakers um, for all of their um, the knowledge that they've shared with us, but for their candidness of the process that they've gone through for the past couple of years. Um, getting to a place where their campus um, can be known as a leader in accessibility. Um, and I know that they've already got students who um, are choosing Atlanta Cape Community College because of this leadership that they have. So congratulations to them. And thank you all very much. I'm going to end the recording and the session now. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming.